since its establishment in 2003, over two decades ago, the CRFM has been a beacon of progress and cooperation within the Caribbean region, promoting sustainable and responsible fisheries development, management and conservation, protection of the marine environment and ecosystem, as well as promoting the welfare and well-being of our hard-working fisher folk and fishing communities that rely on the marine resources for their livelihoods and sustenance. We have been promoting and coordinating action in several critical priority areas, including, but not limited to, data and information management systems, fisheries research and stock assessment, fisheries policy, legal and regulatory frameworks, climate change and disaster risk management, strengthening the participation of fisher folk and other stakeholders in planning, policy formulation and resource management, addressing fish trade and seafood safety issues, IUU fishing, training and capacity, development of public and private sector individuals and entities involved in the fisheries sector, representing the interests of member states and the fishing sector at regional and international meetings and conferences. The CRFM has worked tirelessly to foster cooperation and collaboration among its member states, stakeholders and communities across the region and international development partners to ensure long-term health and viability of our marine resources and ecosystems and the prosperity and well-being of our countries based on the ocean resources. Today's webinar is a testament to the ongoing commitment and dedication of the CRFM, its partners and stakeholders in advancing the principles and practice of blue economic growth and focused on value chain development. As we delve into the presentations and discussions that lie ahead, we will consider various aspects of sustainable fisheries and the broader challenges and opportunities associated with blue growth and value chain development. The concept of blue growth extends well beyond just economic growth and wealth creation. It emphasizes the need for a balanced approach that takes into account environmental conservation, social well-being, and the equitable distribution of benefits. By harnessing the potential of our oceans and coastal, and coastal waters, in a sustainable manner, we can build resilient communities, safeguard biodiversity, and drive economic growth and prosperity for generations to come. During this webinar, we have the opportunity to hear from and engage with practitioners and experts from the private and public sector who have dedicated their efforts to advancing blue growth in various, in various dimensions. So together, we will explore innovative strategies, share best practices, and foster cooperation and partnership as we seek to shape a brighter future for our people and our countries. I want to encourage each of you to actively participate, ask questions, and share your experiences and insights. Your contributions are indeed invaluable, not just in shaping the discussion and outcome of this webinar, but more importantly, in inspiring each other to take bold steps towards realizing the benefits of a sustainable blue economy in our region. In concluding, on behalf of the CRFM and all its partners, I extend my sincere gratitude to everyone involved in making this webinar possible. I wish you an informative and productive session. I have no doubt that the discussions will indeed serve as a catalyst for positive change, empowering us to unlock the full potential of our ocean resources for the benefit of present and future generations. Thank you, God bless you, and let us continue to strengthen the bonds of friendship and cooperation as we seek to intensify our efforts to enhance the contribution of our ocean resources to our social and economic development, and as we think about 
celebrating the 40th anniversary of the CRFM in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Horton, for your welcome and opening remarks. Um, certainly appreciate that you made the time to um, bring, bring us these remarks, um, especially for this blue economic growth discussion, because one of CRFM's strategic priorities is improving the welfare and sustainable livelihoods of fishing and aquaculture communities in its member states through enhancing the role and contribution of fisheries and aquaculture within the blue economy. All right, so meet our panelists. Today we have five members of our panel. We have Mr. Alexander Gervan, who will be presenting on growing the blue economy through overcoming challenges, bridging gaps, and seizing opportunities in post-harvest and regional trade of fish and fish products. The next presentation will be from Ms. Felicia Cruz, who is the director of the Blue Economy Ministry of Blue Economy and Civil Aviation in Belize. And her presentation would be on important considerations for the development of the aquatic value chain within the context of blue economic growth, the Belize experience. Our next presentation will then be by Mr. Winsbert Harry, who is the president of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines National Fish and Folk Organization. And his presentation is going to be on securing small scale fisheries in the context of blue economic growth through value addition and increased capacity of fishers across the seafood value chain. Our next presenter should then be Mr. Udo Card, and he will be presenting on the role of the business sector as a key player across fisheries value chain in strengthening the contribution of fisheries to inclusive blue economic growth and sustainable development. Mr. Karg is the Chief Executive Officer of Ocean Delight in Suriname. Then we'll have a presentation by Ms. Dawn Mason, who is a representative of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO Guyana, and her presentation would be on the development of seafood value chains in the Caribbean blue economy, the case of seabob fishery in Guyana and implications for other fisheries. Now to give you a little insight on our panelists themselves, Mr. Gervan is an environmental economist and an independent consultant. And as an environmental economist, Mr. Gervan has garnered over a decade of experience developing novel economic solutions to environmental problems in NGO, academia, diplomat and the diplomatic context in the Caribbean, as well as globally. He uses stakeholder engagement, economic valuation, value chain analysis, and environmental communication to develop sustainable blue and green economy livelihoods and solutions. Ms. Cruz is the director of the Blue Economy for Belize, and she holds a master's degree in marine science and resource management from the National Taiwan Ocean University in Taiwan, ROC. Having previously worked with the Belize Fisheries Department, Ms. Cruz is one of the female leaders in Belize's blue economy, whose experience and contributions are demonstrated through her ability to coordinate, identify solutions, and build consensus in a dynamic and constantly changing environment. Mr. Harry has been a fisher for over two decades. And Mr. Harry is, like I mentioned before, the president of the SVG NFO and is an active member of the Caribbean Network of Fisher Folk Organizations, the CNFO. In 2019, Mr. Harry became the youngest and second fisher from the Eastern Caribbean to receive the Outstanding Gladding Memorial Award at the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute, GF. GCFI conference. Mr. Karg is the chairman of the Suriname Seafood Association and chief executive officer, as mentioned before, of Ocean Delight. 
He has been very active in promoting the sector and advancing its economic impact. Mr. Karg is intimately familiar with the entire fisheries value chain and plays a key role in the processing sector as a veteran and visionary businessman. He has extensive practical knowledge on aquatic resource value chain development. And finally, Ms. Mason is a national project coordinator for the FAO, working on the Fish for ACP project. This project aims to enhance the value chain of fishery and aquaculture products in Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific countries. Dawn is based in Guyana, where she supports the development of sustainable and inclusive fisheries management practices and policies. She has over 10 years of experience in fisheries research, education, and extension, and has contributed to publications and reports on the sector. So there you have our panel and just a brief intro on them and all the great work and um, perspectives that they will be presenting from um, as they give their presentations this morning. And of course, myself, your host, I am currently a consultant with the CRFM, I'm finishing up my degree at the University of West Indies Center for Resource Management. My focus is really on marine and ocean governance. Um, and I do have quite a bit of experience in that area, as well as in sustainable development, social impact assessment, and youth and gender empowerment. And again, I'm Sanya Compton, and I will be your host. We have some resources here, especially those that are relevant to today's topic. And there's the Ministerial Council and Policy. You can find a lot of this information directly on our website, and we are happy to share this information after the webinar, um, these links will, you would find useful and relevant again to today's topic. So these are resources that you can always tap into. Our first presenter today is Mr. Alexander Gervan. I'm an environmental economist who's been working in the region for the past decade. Um, and increasingly working in the area of fisheries. Uh, I'm very happy to share this panel with um, the esteemed panelists and uh, to see the participant list because um, a lot of the things I've learned about fisheries have been from, from you, from the fisher folk, and from the experts in the region. So here today, I'm, to speak, I'm here to speak about overcoming challenges, bridging gaps, and seizing opportunities in the post-harvest um, trade of fish and fish products. Um, so I'm going to start very, very generally looking at blue economy trends globally. And then home into some of these challenges first, and then opportunities that emerge from these challenges or opportunities that emerge from global and regional trends on fish, fisheries. So as a starting point, um, the blue economy and blue economic growth presents a significant opportunity for sustainable and sustained economic growth for some of the region's most vulnerable people, uh, people involved in fisheries. But I think as an important starting point, we must say that in order for this to be so, uh, the blue economy or the expansion of the blue economy must be inclusive um, slash participatory. It must involve the people it's supposed to benefit. Uh, it must be based on research data and consultation. Um, we have to really build our solutions and build our responses based on the best available data and information. And I put consultation in this line because a lot of data information actually exists from the people on the front lines. And I think as well, for it to yield these benefits that we want it to yield, uh, we must also be proactive in responding to the rapidly changing global market. Caribbean fishers, Caribbean distributors, Caribbean producers cannot wait for innovations um, to come from abroad or for consumers to demand new changes and respond to them. We must be proactive in creating new markets, new products, and new approaches if we really want to gain these benefits. Um, so I just thought it was an important starting point and a kind of foundation for these benefits to, to be gained. Um, speaking about global trends in the blue economy and fisheries, um, we're seeing uh, an increased um, uh, recognition of the importance of the blue economy uh, and the potential of blue economic growth, but yet, uh, like below water, is still the most underfunded of the global pools. And this has knock-on effects for producers that we'll speak about later on. Um, Despite this, the blue economy is expected to double between 2010 and 2030 to a value of $3 trillion. 
And there's significant investment in the past decade in existing, but also emerging industries and subsectors of the blue economy. So there's significant investment in blue tech, remote sensing, renewable energy, shipbuilding and retrofit, but also to a lesser extent, um, sustainable aquaculture uh, and sustainable fisheries, primarily in sustainable aquaculture. So there's an anticipated um, 150 to $300 billion uh, capital expenditure that's gonna happen over the next decade investing in primary agriculture and sustainable fisheries. And globally, we're seeing an increased appreciation of um, sustainable approaches to fisheries management and the environment and the importance of um, biodiversity in uh, the Big Blue. So because of this, there's an increased appreciation of ecosystem approaches to fisheries, justice in fisheries, ecosystem restoration, ecosystem-based management. So really and truly, we have to see this increased recognition or appreciation of this globally um, as something that has to be tracked and integrated into Caribbean fisheries management. Um, and I just put this graph here just to show that aquaculture is really beginning to finally exceed um, marine capture fisheries for human consumption. Um, but you know th this may present a challenge to the Caribbean, but it also presents an opportunity because we have sustained um, natural capture fisheries. So the regional fishery situation as it relates to the blue economy, um, most investment in Latin America and Caribbean in the blue economy is in coastal marine tourism, shipping, oil and gas, and fisheries. Um, we're not seeing as much aquaculture and mariculture investment in the sub-region, uh, but because of growing, growing global interest, we are expecting to see an increase in this in, in the coming years. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean is expected to see an 18% rise in per capita fish consumption, which of course is a major opportunity for the fishery sector. And this growth is really being driven by increased awareness of the health benefits associated with fisheries product consumption, but also income growth and lifestyle changes, which producers have to track and observe in order to take advantage of emerging opportunities. Um, the region also anticipates significant increases in capture fisheries and aquaculture production. Um, but it's a little bit difficult to disaggregate this data um, for Latin America and the Caribbean, Latin America uh, and the Caribbean. So this is kind of just a general situation. Let's talk about some challenges and opportunities as they relate to uh, blue economic growth with fisheries. Um, as you know, uh, and CRFM has been working on this issue significantly the last few years, transportation remains a significant challenge to trade um, of fisheries products. Um, and solutions to lessen container load problems or distribution problems um, are a major challenge, but as you see later on, are also a major opportunity. With regard to transportation, of course, frequency and reliability is a major issue, um, and this is across the CRFM region. I think a challenge that's going to emerge is increased competition from other blue economy industries. If you are a seafaring person, you're an efficient fisher, um, you're going to be an attractive employee for renewable energy offshore. You know, if you're somebody from Carrier who is used to spending five, six, seven, eight days fishing tuna in the Atlantic, you're a fantastic potential employee for offshore fish farm. So there's going to be increased competition from other blue economy industries that we have to be aware of. Um, Non-tariff measures, um, and just to define those, those are policy measures which can potentially have an effect on the volume of goods traded or the price of goods traded. Um, these remain to be a major problem when it comes to fisheries, fish and fisheries products. They're disproportionately affected by these measures. They have um, close to 2.5 as many, uh, two times uh, as many non-tariff measures levied on them versus comparable um, food products. So this remains a significant challenge for fisheries producers, but primarily fisheries exporters. Um, you know, fisheries require significant investment, capture fisheries, but you know, if you're fishing in like or Miami or somewhere else, and you're getting half the value that you anticipated because of some non-tariff measure, it's a serious loss and it's gonna affect your export uh, division. Um, Overexploitation of Caribbean marine capture fisheries also remains a problem, but I wanna focus in here that this is of only certain species or favorite species are the ones that are the most overexploited, and there's significant underexploited species in the Caribbean region that we should be looking towards. Um, seafood literacy is an ongoing and continuous exercise and is an ongoing and continuous challenge. And I say it's an ongoing and continuous exercise because we have to always be educating consumers on new products, new species, and new preparations. 
And I want to distinguish here between domestic and international markets because education here requires slightly different approaches and speak about those in the opportunities. As well, there needs to be education of policymakers and governments on the importance of seafood trade and consumption. You know, when we hear agriculture, we typically think of land or terrestrial agriculture. Um, you know, with a CARICOM 25 by 25, you know, a big part of this push is terrestrial agriculture. There is some free trade involved, but I feel like there needs to be education of policymakers, governments, and we'll get to also banks and financiers later on, on the importance and potential of seafood trade and consumption to the region's peoples uh, and to their electorates. There's also a risk of Caribbean fisheries being left behind in the fisheries data technology boom um, because of traceability demands from global consumers, because of advances in AI, because of the availability of cheap smartphones. You know, there has been a, a rapid change in the way data is collected for fishers, data is collected by governments, um, a rapid change in the way we use data to market and distribute fish. And if we're not taking advantage of that, we will be left behind. A final challenge is private investor wariness. Um, regional and national investors are still wary of fish and fishers investments, even though we've seen a, a major expansion in the ESG boom in things like decarbonizing energy production. This private investor wariness remains a challenge. Let me quickly get to the opportunities. Um, improving distribution and transmission of seafood products in the region is a challenge, but also an opportunity. If somebody can set up a network um, that has good cold chain management across ports and airports in the region and can figure out the logistics and distribution of seafood products, this person can make a lot of money. And, you know, CRFM has been working significantly on this, and I think this is fantastic, but I think people need to start doing this as an opportunity. For CARICOM, import substitution is a major opportunity. Um, restaurant, tourism, and high-end markets typically rely on imported products from Miami because of regular regularity and reliability. We need to be looking at what the restaurant, tourism, and high-end markets are importing to see if we can find substitutes for that in the Caribbean and the Caribbean region. We also need to develop value chains for underutilized species, which I spoke to earlier. When it comes to value addition, um, there needs to be, uh, 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 and we are seeing this innovation, but it needs to be more of this. There needs to be more easy to use value added products for regional and international consumer markets. And for the international consumer markets, what we need to look at is what are people consuming when they come to the Caribbean, whether that be diaspora or tourists. If they're going to Bahamas and they're eating a conch fritter, well, how can we re-export that conch fritter in something that can be put into air fryer back to the diaspora or to that tourist? You know, if that person is coming to St. Lucia or St. Vincent and eating lambi, you know, how can we produce an easy preparation to re-export back to um, that tourist? So I think, you know, for the international and diasporic markets, let's look at what people are eating when they're coming here. And for the domestic markets, let's look at what people are eating in high-end restaurants because that trickles down to the local restaurants and the rest of the markets and consumers and how we can displace that. So a slight difference between international and regional import substitution. Um, I have just two more slides, and I think these are the two most important ones. Um, technology for distribution, the creation of apps and marketplaces has been significant for terrestrial agriculture. This innovation needs to come to fisheries. There needs to be more direct to consumer sales, um, but also business to business sales. In Mexico, this has emerged as a significant way of increasing income for small scale fishers um, by selling directly to high end restaurants. And I want to say here that technology has a very important role in supporting the creation of that new marketplace or those new value chain challenge because technology can reduce the cost for fishers. I can use technology to reduce my marketing costs, my transportation costs, and my logistics costs um, because technology can help me get direct to the consumer or directly to the restaurant. A major opportunity is waste reduction. I wanna say here that using byproducts or waste, um, racks and heads from fish, um, you know, shells from conch, um, uh, byproduct meat. These things may not be extremely profitable in creating byproducts, but if they generate positive environmental benefits, they should be considered as a potential income stream because people are going to be willing to pay more for these products in the future. So if you can make a liquid fertilizer, or if you can crush your lobster shells or your crab shells to make a soil input, or if you can make a ruminant feed and you're breaking even right now, 
as consumer awareness or consumer demand for a more environmentally friendly input increases, the potential for that product to be profitable also increases. My last two slides, um, integrated ecosystem restoration and protected area management approaches are also a major opportunity. If you go to an international donor agency and get funding to restore a coral reef or to restore a mango or to set up a protected area that can also generate income for tourism or have spillover effects in terms of additional biomass, what fisheries are actually doing is they're reducing the cost of fishing. They'll be more fish in the sea, they'll be more efficient. So I wanna say that we don't only look, want to look at opportunities where, which are about increasing income or accessing new export markets, we also need to look at opportunities which reduce costs. And doing things which are environmentally friendly are one of the best ways to reduce costs right now because international donor agencies are willing to pay for those environmental benefits. So not just increasing income, but reducing costs. My last slide, I think the big opportunity for Caribbean small-scale fisheries is the idea of fish with a story. And I don't want to say that fish with a story is my idea. I've seen it done in other countries. It's being done right now quite successfully in South Africa. But what I'm trying to say here is that everybody you know, in Barbados has their flying fish woman. Everybody in Trin Trinidad has their kingfish man. And when we buy fish or food, we want to buy fish and food with a story. So products from small scale fisheries, which integrate participation, involve the fishers, integrate sustainability, produce things in a more sustainable way, which is what consumers want, integrate traceability, so consumers know where the fish is coming from, but also what that fisher person, that fisher man, fisher woman looks like who's selling on the fish. This is the best foundation to market and sell fish and fisheries products in the region and beyond. Consumers want to know what, where, and how a fish production and if we use this approach, we can begin to respond to multiple consumer demands, but also regulate, regulatory demands and emerging opportunities in the blue economy. So we want to sell fish with a story. And if we're saying, listen, we're meeting this environmental regulation, this environmental condition, that's a better story for that fish. If I have better traceability and somebody knows what their um, fish a person looks like, that means you know, you can sell fish for um, a higher value. So I just want to say, let's get into this idea of fish with a story. It's really one of the best possible ways to make blue economic growth in this space truly inclusive and beneficial for the people who are out there in the hot sun and the salt um, to bring delicious things to our to our plates uh, into our lives. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for going over time, Sanya. Um, we're looking forward to the discussion. Well, it was indeed quite informative and engaging. So thank you, Alexander. So I now turn it over to Ms. Cruz. The important considerations for the development of the aquatic value chain within the context of the blue economic growth, um, the Belize experience. For Belize, it is important that we firstly define what inspires and motivates us to now um, look into the development of these aquatic value chains that will definitely contribute to the socioeconomic benefits and contributions um, to our nations. Um, another component that's integral is understanding the value chains that are represented within our countries. And lastly, I'll be highlighting or touching on developing the requisite governance structures that help the fishing sectors propel um, into adding value to various fish products and other commodities that are derived from the sea. Fish and fish products um, have contributed significantly to domestic food security to job creations, um, income generation, economic development, and have an important linkage to the tourism sector in Belize and in the wider Caribbean. Uh, in essence, uh, the fishing sector is very vital to our people's livelihoods. And the concept of fisheries value chain is an integral part of blue economy strategies and critical for established fisheries and new sectors such as blue biotrade. 
For Belize, the Belize Fisheries Department underneath the Ministry of Blue Economy and Civil Aviation have conceptualized the significance for developing fisheries value chain and the blue economy as a policy priority and is consequential for sustainable economic development in Belize. The national policy and strategy embraces essential actions that will serve the mainstream blue economy and fisheries value chain strategies in the development of the fisheries sector. The value chain consists of a series of activities that create and build value along the chain. Increase private sector participation and public-private partnerships in fisheries development are really determined by our understanding of the components and segments of fisheries value chains and the opportunities for investment that they provide. Essential to these value chains are the associated supply chain, the center of which lie fishers, the fishing gears, fishing technology, fishing cooperatives, and more importantly, the steady supply of fisheries products. Other issues such as volume, packaging, certification, labeling, transport, supply chain management, market conditions, and the change in policy or regulations are also critical to fisheries value chains. If Inefficiencies such as lack of skills, technology, investments, and infrastructure in fisheries value chains are not properly understood and addressed. Opportunities for fisheries diversification, for value-added products, market access, and employment generation, and foreign exchange earnings will be lost. Opportunities for the fisheries sector lie in the use of sustainable energy to contribute to reduce cost of production and value added fishery accreditation develop new fishing gear enhancing spatial management of fishers to reduce competition between users such as fisheries fishers versus tourism activities within marine protected areas or maritime transport, and of course, um, the regional and international collaborations. This may also include the need for considering enhancement between the linkages between fishers and tourism. For the fishers value chain, um, due to the interest of time, I'll be talking about the lobster and conch value chain. Um, for Belize, while the lobster and conch fishers are both mature markets, opportunities still exist in developing new products in emerging market trends, which could help increase the presence of Belizean products in the U.S. and other markets. Further economic potentials lie in developing marine fisheries or fin fish fisheries, improving the value change of the seafood processing sector, exploring of exploration of the deep water resources and access to non-traditional non markets. Other possible interventions may also include capacity building for our fishers and our institutions and improvements in fishing gear and technology as well as associated infrastructure. In Belize, the Caribbean spiny lobster is the most important fishery commodity in terms of its volume and the revenue produced and the people employed both formally and informally within the industry. In terms of foreign market, Lobster has contributed to 75% um, of total seafood products exported from Belize, according to the Fisheries Department. And for the last four decades, the lobster production has really remained stable, um, ranging from between 400,000 to 750,000 pounds. 
In 2019, and as you know, this was pre-COVID-19, um, there were a little more than 500,000 pounds of lobster tail that was produced, which represents a significant increase compared to the year before. Um, also, you can see that for that year, the lobster landings amounted to um, almost 400,000 pounds, which also represents an increase of about 18% compared to the previous years. Um, in total, the lobster export earnings for that year amounted to about 13.4 million US dollars, which culminatively represented um, an increase of 13% um, for that year. The main actors in the spine and lobster value chain includes fishers who act as the producers as well as primary processors. In relation to the lobster tails, the two fishermen cooperatives and the two private companies are the four main buyers, secondary processors and exporters, while domestic middle buyers, retail sellers and restaurants, and of course, the end, end consumer, both local and from the, important, from the importing countries, play a secondary role. Um, this is a description of the value chain map that was produced for lobster, and it really highlights the production, processing, um, distribution, retail, and consumption phases along the value chain. It also looks at the local consumers, foreign consumers, and the black market. Um, this was a previous value chain <laughs> that was produced. And as you can see, there were significant gaps in terms of understanding the pricing um, along the value chain. So um, there has been great efforts done underneath the GCF readiness project entitled Enhancing Adaptation Planning and, and Increasing Climate Resilience in the Coastal Zone and Fisheries Sector of Belize. Um, and this has produced uh, very valuable uh, information that looks at sustainable fishing operations, practices and technologies, and understanding the value chains for key um, resources and locations within Belize. Um, very briefly for Kong, um, it is the second largest um, commodity and it has experienced fluctuation in terms of its production. I think importantly here, um, just similar to lobster, um, the fishers act as both producers and primary processors since they prepare um, the fillet and the lobster before selling it to the cooperatives and other um, secondary processors or buyers. Uh, this is the map of the uh, value chain for Queen Kong. And again, it, it provides a similar depiction um, as that with lobster, um, highlighting the local and foreign uh, consumers and the, the processes along the value chain. Um, we have another depiction of um, a local value chain that was produced for Kong as well. Underneath governance, I think it is very important for us to highlight that the Ministry of Blue Economy and Civil Aviation has really worked um, tireless and quickly, tirelessly and quickly uh, to establish the requisite institutional regime and policy framework that really has assisted with the upper, like, upper rationalization of the blue economy pathway for Belize. And within this comes in on strategies or actions that are required to enhance or to promote the value addition component within the fisheries sector. Um, the government of Belize have endorsed our blue economy policy strategy and implementation plan, as well as a five-year maritime economy plan that also provides affirmation and validation on the importance of blue economy um, to further advance the economic growth of our blue space and 
and resources in the most sustainable and responsible manner. Um, there are other policies, national and international, of course, and agreements in which um, have influenced the policy and legislative framework for Belize. Important to note is the Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy, which aims to ensure that the fisheries sector remains healthy, productive, and viable into the future. And marine fish has been designated as, a, as one of the priority commodity. Um, it is, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the tremendous effort on continued great work from the CRFM in the elaboration and implementation of this policy, which is very important to all of us member states who are present on the panel and joining in. Um, from the blue economy as an evolving paradigm, we must, it must be demonstrated to provide incremental value to the overall national development framework as an engine for achieving blue growth. For Belize, um we have our policy that touch in on the value chain development and management uh priorities but there are other national policies that hone in on value chain development which include our growth and sustainable development strategy our national fisheries policy strategy and action plan and our maritime economies plan um in Importantly, I want to highlight that these motivations, these, these assessments, these projects, these um, activities that the government of Belize through the Ministry of Blue Economy and Civil Aviation have engaged in are really important considerations that we need to take um, into account as small island developing states as it will help us to develop our value chains and value systems within the confinement of blue economic growth, thus contributing immensely to our socioeconomic interests and our livelihoods. I'd also like to just finally congratulate the CRFM on the celebrations for the 20th anniversary, and I appreciate the opportunity to share the Belizean experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. And we will now invite our next presenter, who would be Ms. Dawn Mason. And she would be presenting on the development of the seafood value chain in the Caribbean blue economy, the sea bob fishery in Guyana, and implications for other fisheries. Good morning, all, and thank you, uh, CRM and Sanyo for giving me this opportunity to present the Fish for AC project on the Guyana Sea Bog Value Chain Fishery. All right, this is the story of the Guyana Sea Bog Fishery. As we all know, it's a, sorry, I don't think you know, but it's a two component fishery. We have an industrial side that uses the, um, trawl fishery and then there's the artisanal fishery the um uh industrial fishery itself it amounts to about 90 percent of the total catch for the fish sea fish and um the artisanal it's just about three percent or so these are the only two fisheries that they um that harvest this fishery, um, this catch. Could you move to the other slide? I've also had, we've also through the fisher ACP project, we've done an analysis of the fishery and this is where we come in. They, they found most of the um, things that we already know about the fishery, the industrial fishery, it's MSC certified, it is well organized. And we have the artisanal fishery, which is disorganized, fragmented, and also just contributes about 3%, as I just said, on the fishery itself, of the total catch. Next slide, please. 
right? You know, this fishery itself has been declining over the years. From 2011, we noticed we had a slight increase, and in 2014, it's been going down and raises again, and now we see it's on the decline. The value of the fishery itself now, it's just about 31 million US dollars with about 16 tons of catch. Next slide, please. I'm going very fast. I want to be disciplined and finish in my 10 minutes. Right, some of the challenges that we've had with the fishery itself, as you can see, I hope you can see clearly, is the artisanal fishery, as we said, it's fragmented with no representation, little or no representation. They have no data on the catch. You have lack of standards and supporting infrastructure. You have low transparency in monitoring and enforcement. The industrial side, well, it's well organized because of MSC certification. We, um, what we find though, there's no kind of marketing plan, no future development for the fishery itself. And you, from the other challenges we have, we have limited female ownership and of businesses and participation in decision making. Next slide. All right, so after we did the um, analysis of the fishery, we brought the actors back in, all the stakeholders, and we um, they agreed with what was found because from the analysis, and we assisted them in developing a plan for the upgrade, and this is what we came up with. In 2032, Guyana will have strengthened its position as a leading export of seabob fish globally by ensuring a sustainable and resilient value chain for the seabob across industrial and artisanal fishery that is well developed and supported by data with improved infrastructure, artisanal fishers and empowerment for women across both channels. All right, next slide. So this is the theory of change. I will go through this now. Um, from the next slide, what we the, um, it shows here from the bottom, that's the uh, statement for Guyana and then um, for the improvement of the upgrade strategy. And then you have the economic environment and social um, improvements that will happen over the next 10 years. I should tell you now that it's a five-year, the Fish for ACP project is a five-year project, but we have done a 10-year project for the fisheries department, for the fisheries itself. Sorry about that. Let me go through each of the um, four areas. Can you get to that next slide, please? All right, so when we come up with four um, outcomes, one for the uh, industrial sector, we have one for the artisanal, the fisheries department. So the first outcome is the industrial farms adapt sustainable practices to maintain MSY stock levels, reduce pressure on stock and build resilience. In doing so, we will um, hope to, one of the outputs is to a strategic vision and marketing plan for the export growth, industrial research priorities identified and research plan developed to stabilize the stock, and industrial firms and their workers trained on sustainable fishery practices in line with MSC recommendations and research findings and development of an OHS, Occupational Health and Safety Plan, developed and workers trained in industrial processing plans. This all is to maintain MSC certification. Um, there is also training, a lot of training will take place in, in here. We plan to develop a uh, research plan for each large strategy for the fisheries and also a um, 
OHS plan will be developed for them. It comes, when it comes to the outcome to artisanal fishers, um, what we're looking at here is maintaining a healthy stock. We know a lot of the artisanal fishery happens in, at river mouths and um, close to the mangroves, and they are, some of them are responsible for the destruction of man mangroves to um, assist with their building their pens in the ocean. But we want to work with them, developing a uh, working group. We've recognized that they are so fragmented and they have no um, representation at the national level. So we hope to bring them together in groups and have that um, for better representation. We want to also know what is the impact of those Chinese sail fishing on the stock levels and the bycatch. We want to identify those bycatch so, so better understand how to manage the fishery itself. We have fishers trained on sustainable fishing practices. Once we know what are the impacts, we will be able to train them better and also have um, climate smart technologies and introduce to them. And we want to connect them to inputs. We recognize that these artisanal fishers, the lowest in the social chain, they have um, and also economic they have less access to finance, and we want to ensure that they are able to access finance to the system. Next slide, please. Our third outcome is for the fisheries department itself is to increase compliance with the enforcement of revised fisheries regulation by improving data collection and coordination between. BC stakeholders, the value chain stakeholders. Here we're going to develop a communication strategy. We we also see the necessity of having the um, officials from both the artisanal and industrial fishery engage in co-management. So we need a strategy for that. We will develop it, um, a communication strategy to assist us in that. The catch and effort and data collection monitoring system will be improved. We're going to assist them in acquiring computers, tablets, and a new um, database for them to store and manage the fishery so that they could um, yeah, manage the fishery in a more efficient manner. We have the fisheries regulation because of what will happen with the data collection. We recognize that some of the regulations they have to be changed, so we're going to help them in that area and as i said before improve co-management in the fisheries department with monitoring in the fourth outcome we're going to work again with the artisanal actors in food safety and quality practices in the high value markets recognize because of the infrastructure at some of the wharves they need upgrading some of them need new wharves themselves so we're going to identify first um, donors to assist us in those areas <clears throat> we want to train fishers also to um, in fish handling. Um, uh, we want to set up a network of women fishers and vendors because we recognize also that women are always just in vendors and um, in processing, and we want to move away from that, get them more involved in the fishery sector. During the value chain analysis, so we found it was um, not only that they were only vendors, we found out that they are not, once it, they are not boat owners, they are not able to be part of the efficient war. So all of that we want to change. We want to ensure that they are part in the decision making process. So now, in all together, so with the implementation of these, uh, we want to implement these activities and also to do that, we've engaged partners, regional, national and international partners to assist with the implementation of these activities that we want to get into. We have also managed to um, have a CBOB working group. We've expanded it to include the artisanal fishery. Formerly it was just for the industrial fishery, and again, it was for MSC certification process. 
So we are going to include them and the management of the fishery will be integrated with the uh, artisanal and the industrial fishery. Our hope is not to have um, increased production as such, but to increase the adoption, the adoption of sustainable fishing practices and build capacity at the fisheries department to revise policies, regulation, and based on, based on sound scientific evidence and data collection. We will not be, the impact on the stock itself would be limited. We're not interested in including um, in increasing volume, or we're interested in increasing, uh, ensuring that the sustainable fishing practices Catch levels should decrease. We've recognized in the um, artisanal fishery that other than ha them having, they, they have a lot of fish pens, and we want to ensure that those are reduced. And the catches themselves, once they are handled properly, they wouldn't have a lot of spoilage, and they can actually have um, a better product for the customers. Right. In terms of implications for the other fishing sector, I think once that, I didn't do a slide for that, but I think once we have the co-ops up and running, because in the um, analysis, what we found is that because the artisanal fishery, this particular fishery, the Chinese same fishery, is such a small fishery, just 3% of the um, total production. What we found a lot of times is that the other um, artisanal fishery would be able to benefit from the upgrade strategy that we've put in place, like upgrading the wharves, training officials, ensuring that the co-ops are functioning um, optimally, that their inclusion of other stakeholders other than the fishers themselves, but other actors within the value chain. So I'm thinking that once that happens, we can have a better, um, it would be a positive um, influence on the other fisheries itself. We also think that the, uh, the data collection system that would be set up by the project itself would benefit the other fisheries. The fisheries department just don't go out in isolation and pick up um, collect data on one particular fishery itself, we collect data on all the fisheries, so they would be able to manage those fisheries and perhaps um, have management plans in place for the other fisheries, like the sea dog fishery. Uh, next slide. All right, this just tells you about the Fish for ACP project. Diana was just one of the 12 countries that was selected from about 80 countries to be part of the value chain analysis and upgrade. Thank you. That's my next slide. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ms. Mason. We will now move on to our next presentation, which would be from Mr. Winsbert Harry. And he'll be presenting on securing small scale fisheries through value addition and increased capacity for fishers across the seafood value chain. Well, good afternoon. I see it after um, one by now. Let me welcome persons from near and far. I know that we usually do these things um, face to face, but the new technology is here. Um, I'm seeing some familiar face on, on the call. I'm really appreciated to be as as a fisherman to be on this panel to share my issues or uh, share a concern in the, the addition of the increased adaptation across the seafood and value chain and securing small scale fisheries. I'm Winsworth Harry, I'm, um, I'm a fisherman. I'm the president of the national organization that was said earlier on. In my presentation today, I will be more focusing on some of the value chain in St. Vincent, but as the, the pres the, as the vice president of the Caribbean network of fisher folks organization, I will be within the presenting, in my presentation, you will hear I must speak broadly more concerning St. Vincent and what the value chain and what fisher folks in the Caribbean are really seeing within the blue economy and the blue economy and the blue growth across 
my outline i will be looking at um three three headings which is the small scale fisheries the importance of the value chain in st vincent the need of capacity in the economic growth so slide one please small scale fisheries in the caribbean fisheries is important for trade and export it generates revenue and it promotes value addition when i say trade and export what i notice within the caribbean and within st vincent and the grenadines is that we are not doing enough um trading with each other and we are not doing enough um exporting with each other and when we look at it we see our food in bill within the region uh very high and while other caribbean countries might be exporting more than some we still importing more second we look at um, employment and livelihood that generate income and provide jobs the fishing industry has been seen over the years in the value chain as persons who really have no other sources of doing anything just to get involved in the fishing industry but it's to me it's more beyond that now because we're looking at livelihoods and when we look at livelihoods it's not only the livelihoods that we say i'm fishing this is my livelihood we have to say as we say it provides job fishing is a job and also uh, we have to really see fitting within our livelihood as um business so this is something that we are promoting in st vincent and across the region is to to see how fishers could generate more income because we notice that there's um there's a high cost in terms of operation our operation in the types of fishing and our fishing activities we are getting engaged in and the jobs that we provide in it as well because we are seeing that persons are not taking up this job opportunity but there's room for persons who want to get involved in the fishing industry because some persons only say that you have to really be in a boat to get involved in the, in the industry but there's jobs in this industry for persons to get involved in third we look at um food food security and it reduce poverty with good protein source and increased food affordability because when i said um good proteins um what we are noticing now that uh along the region and in st vincent and the grenadines is that persons are not getting um the fish that they they are supposed to eat i don't know i know that climate change are playing a very um important role and the price of fish is really increasing because of the challenges that um fish folks are facing in terms of the price of fuel and also that um we are not seeing the fish that we're supposed to see and it, it really in it really reducing that the proteins that the person supposed to get and we need to increase the affordability because um the more the price of fuel the more the market cars transportation everything increased what we are seeing is that persons will not be able to purchase fish at a at a reasonable um price so we need to see how we can look into that in within the value chain fisheries and st vincent and the grenadines small scale fisheries artists and monthly game and spaces the days and the techniques that our fishers are using is a more tradition fishing days but we need to see how we can upgrade with new technology um better boats we know that there's a lot of spaces within the region that we are not um utilizing because of the, the size of boats the other thing we need to educate our fishers within the value chain within artisanal um what is artisanal fishing and what is not um, um fishing because fishers still not understand the, the that word in in a whole um, holistic way also say that like, how we can be small scale and when some fishers are in a smaller boat when others are in bigger boats but we are in one space so we need to see how we can 
officers using better gears and and utilizing the spaces that are available. In St. Vincent as well too, we have over 2,500 workers that are employed in the in the in the fishing industry. And what I'm seeing is that we are not attracting many young persons within the fishery sector in St. Vincent and across the region. And we need to see how again we can sell the idea of in, within the fishery sector, how we attract young people into the fisheries, how we attract young females into the fishing industry. And you could see with I find this is uh this can grow within the region as well too. I could see the figures are, are, are very low in terms of how many persons are engaged in the in in, in, in the fishing industry. I see in this day as a as a way out and see and take up these new challenges and get involved in the fishing industry. Fishers use traditional gears, metals, and other vessels. And with these traditional gears that we use as metals and other vessels, where well, I highlighted as well too, as a fisherman, the gears that we use are very some people might say old school. The metals we use, some people might say old school. The vessels, the persons might see um, as old school. We need to utilize and inform the fishers and educate the fishers about new technology, how to use new technology as well too. It's not only to educate the fishers, but it's how to use them. We need to have better communication in terms of how we the metals we use and the vessels we fish and focus in region like in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are now trying to move away from the open period, which is um 25 feet in length. We and then the government is embarking in a fleet expansion program where fish and folks can spend more days at sea and bring in um more catch that they could um own a better income. But the assistant is really needed to see how across the region, how do the assistant give it to fisher folks? One of the challenges that fisher folks I say with these vessels is that um, the insurance, most persons is not coming on board and assisting with the insurance that to fish folks who buy a boat for 200 and something thousand dollars. We need to see how we can work on that at a regional um, way out to uh, have more persons adapting. And we need to also to change the mindset of our fishers because some of our fishers we um keep in the old school way and this is a new way so we need to see how we can get that change change of mindset we need to see how we can get the fishers move to um different types of engine that could um reduce their costs the vessels that are used to catch ocean and inshore pelagic as well as safe and deep the mussels, um, when I say snappers, the mussel, I mean like the redfish. Um, I know in St. Vincent we fishing seasonally, where we fishing six months, where we go up to the to the high seas and look for dolphin and kingfish, and the other six months we spend in show where we look for the snappers, the red, the, the butterfish, the red hind. But what we have noticed over the years now is that we're not seeing this um these pelagics in our um house. Path too, and we are seeing more fishers now adapting to the intro fishing because of the of the climate change and the the easy access where you could go to these grounds and use up um less fuel and then you could have um an income for your family. Well, the valley train, um, I could say there was a study that was done and published by FAO in 2021. The fisheries vision engaging a fad based value chain from 2017 and with this um value chain we target a fishing community in clay valley where we see the transformation of that fishing community and fish are focusing in that community and uh, where we see uh, since that fad um, based value chain we see we move from two million to 36 million dollars after seven years we saw fish folks own their own boat we saw fisher folks develop so with more assistance given to fisher folks i think this could be um, a benefit for fisher folks going forward
Can I really also done up and publish a, a, a study that was done in 2001, looking at um, the value chain for counting siblings in tiny grenadines? As we know, um, about 65, 66% of our, um, our of our accounts are export, and we own a value of US 1.5, 1.564. Million dollars, about a million dollars and so on. And most of this count has been done in the northern and the southern Grenadines. But what we are noticing now is that the conch are going into deeper and deeper waters, and fisher folks are now in urge to go deeper. And some fisher folks are getting bins. And St. Vincent County Grenadines is the leading exporter in the Windward Island for conch. The importance of the value chain, fisher folks are vital. Any fisheries, fisheries in the value chain to support the fishers. I could say that the fisheries division has been good to all of the, the fisher folks organization, including the national organization in St. Vincent. I think there is a good relationship between the fisheries division and the, um, the primary fisher folks organization in St. Vincent. The value chain provides a good source of income to the economy of St. Vincent and the Grenadines because I, I could say from since the introduction of the FAD, we had seen um, an increase of 1.5 to the GDP. Knowing the difference of stakeholders in the value chain is important to understand the challenge that the sector face. The value chain is important across the economy applied for many other sectors, example, the tourism and the culture and transportation. The value chain provides need and source of income and livelihood for food security. The challenges. While well, there are many challenges that are facing fisheries and overfishing, pollution, IU fishing, gender equality, equal issue, the foreign are uh, some most, I will just touch on coronavirus. I noticed since the coronavirus come in 2020, there was no serious attention given to the fishery sector in, in the Caribbean region. And I would like to encourage and say to this forum, more need to be done when there is a serious issue like this AB comes out because I think that the fisher folks in the region was totally left out and was left on the back border and we could we could not conduct our fishing operation in the best way that we used to. We look at also at the impact of climate change. We know that the sargasm seaweed is around. We notice that we are having the, the Sahara dust. We notice the, the water level, the quality uh not biting and there is a serious um study and a serious um workshop need to be done how do we educate our fishers about climate change how the communication go from the fishers to the, the to the, the technical piece persons how to come back so i think we, there's a lot of gaps need to be filled when you look at climate change looking at the fishing industry in 2021 we have the eruption of the lasso free volcano where we see a very serious um impact in our shorelines um there was a depletion of our catch on the the northern side um it is still habitat uh it's still it um reprobation um fisher folks can couldn't conduct their business in in the best way their visibility was poor um it was a lesson learned for most fisher folks in st vincent and the grenadines across the building for the blue economy the fisheries and agriculture is a vital role because of the different stakeholders involved fisher folks can be straight and the business are using a tax to it is not why there is need for economic growth and development in this sector this is across the region so i'm not running out of time so i just i i mentioned some of these in 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 my previous slide in my conclusion in st vincent there is support in the division in projects some of the project support are small scale fishes like including that their support in the national organization is still promoting fish silage and fish compost. We are also looking at um, DG fish, checking the vice of fish folks and vessels because we know that with the, the weather, the challenges that fish folks, we are know that every year each country at least lost about five to six fishers when they venture to conduct the, um, their jobs. And we are looking at these devices that we can check them. Canary, we are working at uh, setting up um, artisanal reef in the South Coast Marine Park. Um, the South Coast Marine Park will be our first marine protective area and 
and mainland St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And there is a need for continued support and capacity for fishers to add value and more business and have comprehensive edge to develop and grow in the blue economy. And with this, say, I would like to say I wish I had more time to go into details, but I would like to say very thank you very much to the Fishery Division, also to CRFM Senior System, Mr. Um, Chris Isaac. I want to say a special thanks to um, Panari and the staff of the call for strengthening me into performing in my role as a fisher folk leader in the region. I cannot do anything or say anything without mentioning the good work that Panari has done, the Office of the Caribbean Network of Fisher Folks Organization, and also the Fishery Division, my technical team, Mr. Elano Gara and his wife. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Winsburg, for that presentation. We're going to swiftly move into our final final presentation, and that would be by Mr. Karg. So, Mr. Karg, it's over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, ladies and other participants on this uh, 25th anniversary remembrance of our organization. It is an honor to be invited and to represent uh, Suriname uh, in this uh, meeting and moreover to uh, present our fish processors and exporters uh, from Suriname. Uh, we are the end of uh, the chain of the fish uh, industry in Suriname, and uh, we also are the door with our products to the rest of uh, the world. Uh, to have said that, we uh, like to take you on how it uh, started uh, as uh, from our companies, which we are uh, representing uh, today. Uh, we started with uh, the founding in October 10th by uh, Steve Walton and the person you talk, he was uh, talking to now. Uh, with the founding of uh, CFAP and V uh, for processing uh, fish and fish products for the local market. We started with uh, CIS uh, co workers, and now CFAP is one of the players on the international market and provide job security for uh, where 136 families can uh, rely on. The third pound in uh, mm -hmm. the Suriname fish uh, industry and the Suriname sector started in 1994 when uh, the, by then, a director of the fish industries of uh, the fisheries department of the Ministry of Agriculture, Mr. Liefeld, invited FAO experts to Suriname for a week long seminar on uh, the hazard which was by then very unknown, what does it mean and what does it stand for. The main reason why we had to go uh, to the international market was because of the implementation of these uh, HACCP uh, rules. Our local market is too small to make goods on the return of these investments to comply to these new rules. We uh, set up a new plant and uh, made a new start. By December uh, 2000, the fishery sectors were uh, able, were successful, able to pressure our parliament to pass uh, the law, which uh, made Suriname uh, able to comply to all the EU, uh, EU standard rules, so we could keep exporting certain fish products to the EU. As a company, as Suvap Salaf, we uh, had to start completely from the bottom since uh, we were out during the time that we were rebuilding the factory to comply to all these rules. And we started with the company uh, Comfish, what by then was uh, in the aquaculture business of uh, Red Tilapia, which we exported uh, for a year to the Netherlands. In 2003, uh, Mr. Uh, Johnny de Boer, uh, fish captain for Taza Fisheries, stepped into our office and announced that he has all the intentions to start 
his own company and uh, work, and he bought a uh, 64, uh, a 19, uh, in 1964 Bill's uh, trawler and asked us to take care of his fish and uh, the exports of this. And the same person is now uh, the CEO of uh, Marisa Fisheries, one of our biggest uh, industrial uh, fishing uh, companies. In 2008, uh, we started uh, a SUFAP with the processing and export of tuna and tuna related species. The markets where we export uh, to by 2010 was uh, mainly, by 2000 was mainly the EU and especially the Netherlands. In 2003, we were able to uh, start doing something in the United States and also a little bit in the Caribbean uh, by then uh, in uh, Trinidad. 2008 uh, for us became uh, more serious with uh, volumes to uh, the United States and the EU, uh, mostly fresh products which we were able to ship out on uh, cargo flights uh, twice a week to the States and uh, on the passenger flights, which we have almost the uh, daily to mm -hmm. the Netherlands. In 2011, uh, the export mm -hmm. of frozen fish also became a serious part of our uh, export product. And we were able to uh, make shipments to Latin America and the Far East mm -hmm. as a new uh, market for us. 2000 14, the Caribbean market became uh, more serious and more important, uh, not only for our company, but uh, for most of the processing companies in Suriname. As you could see that uh, on the slides, uh, the production figures of uh, SUFEP from uh, 2014 going up and 2019 beginning 2022 when we all got uh, hit by the coronavirus. Uh, but in the meantime, as mentioned earlier, uh, the other fish company, uh, especially in the fishing company from Mr. De Boer, started uh, its growth and uh, as you see on the flight, this is how uh, Marisa Fisheries has, uh, looks like now with their fleet. That means that uh, in 2016, because of the growth of Marisa Fisheries, we uh, sat together and we looked at the facilities of SUFEP and came to the conclusion that uh, the big investments Marisa Fisheries did to expand their fleet would uh, make it necessary to set up a new plant because uh, the space and the land we have available for a CFAP, what has already reached its limit. So uh, we founded the new company under the name of Ocean Delight Suriname, in which both CFAP, uh, Enfi, and my fisheries participate for a 50-50%. We had the official opening of this company in June uh, 23 of 2019. This is how uh, Ocean uh, Delight uh, is now. And uh, we employ over there about uh, 170 uh, workers, which uh, is uh, quite uh, a lot, but we are happy to do that because we make sure that the families are well uh, taken care of. But as the rest of the world was hit in 2019, uh, beginning 2020 uh, by COVID, also the Sunnam fish sector had it very hard. We uh, faced with heavy declines in the export uh, almost uh, impossible to be able to change the crews for the troll uh, boats 
and which caused a very big drop in our production. Uh, the production uh, was also seen like the previous seed you saw at Sufep also uh, goes actually for the whole uh, sector by then uh, who was hit by the COVID pandemic. To give you an idea what we are talking about, uh, I found it also important to let you know how our uh, fish industry is uh, based on, and that takes us to the beginning of uh, our sector. Uh, Suriname started industrial fisheries in uh, with uh, shrimp in 1960 and uh, recognized the importance of the never ending uh, source that it needed to be protected. So the first rules of protection started around 1960. Nowadays, uh, we have uh, it in such a way protected that we uh, shares all the different type of uh, fishing that we have, the inward, the inland fisheries, which uh, is only consumed nowadays by the uh, local market and then we have the fishing folk the, the coast fisheries and the deep water fisheries and all of those ty different types of fishery are divided by their own depth and their own uh, type of fishery uh, to make sure that we avoid uh, overfishing the challenges super, uh, Suriname uh, fish sector is facing is mainly the IUU fisheries, and this is possible because our insufficient control of our fishing grounds. And another big problem that we have here, and uh, which really needs to uh, get a very fast uh, attention, is that of uh, the knowledge, the lack of data, because our last biomass research already dated back to the end of the 1970s. What does the future for the fish sector in Suriname looks uh, like? Uh, we propose that as soon as possible, we will be able to have this biomass research uh, be done. We estimate that it will take about two and a half to three years. And this uh, biomass research should not only be done for Suriname alone, but throughout uh, the, the three Guyanas, Guyana, Suriname and French Guyana. Further, it is very important that we are able to lower the IAU fisheries on uh, Suriname grounds. It is estimated that by lowering one third of IAU fisheries will have an uh, estimated increase in the catch mainly by the coastal fisheries for about 100 percent. The uh, increase of processing jobs and exports and increase also by 100 percent of the state income. So uh, the other thing that we need to be done is to bring the product closer to the end consumer which means investments in processing uh, technique and packing. And to as to uh, make it more clear and more important, uh, the role as we see it from Suriname as a part of the Caribbean market is to focus our marketing efforts more on introducing uh, less known species in uh, the Caribbean uh, markets, especially uh, focus on the uh, population of the Caribbean and uh, which will help us to come closer to the 25-25 program because uh, we have about 32 different species which uh, are processed commercially and which uh, most of them are not the most expensive type of fish. We do have expensive type of fish in Suriname, 
which are entering the Caribbean market, but are mostly consumed by the tourists, which is a big industry in the Caribbean. But uh, the other species, which are less expensive, should be as the uh, get to be more and more mm -hmm. well known for the Caribbean population, so that uh, we can also keep on assisting and keep up the protein uh, part of the diet. I thank you for uh, your attention and uh, looking forward if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karg, and certainly another interesting presentation to wrap up. So at this point in time, we're now going to move right into our moderated session. I do see that we have one hand raised and I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Kong. Please unmute yourself and go ahead with your intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. I, I, I'll try my best to be as brief as possible. First, I would like to thank the presenters for the excellent presentation. Um, as you know, this is a very compli compli com complicated subject. Um, um, among some of the key points that was raised during the presentation and it, um, is the issue of proactivity. And I just want to make two general comments. I don't want to get into the discussion, but we all know what um, um, some of the clear issues of these comments are. And then I'll just um, speak to some recommendations. Um, to be proactive, we as a region must tackle significant obstacles that exist at various levels. And some of the pressing critical problems can be contextualized as equity and reciprocity on, I would say, about th on, on three levels. Firstly, at the global level among developing countries and developed countries. The prognosis of the impact of climate change on our fisheries here in our region is not good. And we as a region must be more forceful so that developed countries pay their fair share to tackle to tackling climate change. So much said about that. There's another level, Chair. The, the, I, I look at it at the macro level. Notwithstanding the attractiveness of the blue economy, in theory, the truth is, among the various blue e economy sectors, there is no equity and there is lopsided power. I speak of the dynamic between oil and gas, tourism, seabed mining, etc., 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 versus fisheries and aquaculture. And of course, we know the latter is far less um, powerful. Um, those are some general comments. Um, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we need to go into any big discussion on that, but I think we, we all recognize that. Well, let me look at that another level in terms of equity and reciprocity and that is at the local level that is equity for value chain actors we need to ensure equitable returns for our primary producers who are primarily small scale fishers um, within our region we need to talk about the level of earnings of our primary producers when compared to other actors within that value chain and I'd be very interested to know if anybody have any insight on this, any, any framework, any mechanism that could look into that. And let me close with a recommendation for consideration. And I'd be surprised if this is, this is not in train. But could we look at a regional approach to accessing niche markets, similar to what we have seen um, practice in the tourism sector? Huh? Key strategies could involve among others, regional agreement on specific fisheries, perhaps conch, lobster, I don't know. But um, regarding things like the use of waste has been discussed over and over again, such as the shell and the conch opercula. The region could collectively market selected products to the diaspora and to environmentally friendly conscious consumers as sustainable products in the context of sustainable livelihoods seeds as well as protecting the integrity of the aqua um, of the aquatic ecosystems those two last points here i i would be very interested to hear the the, the take of the panelists on, on on those two last um issues thanks chair thank you mr Kong. and to our panelists i do recognize um peter has his hand raised but i would like to give the panelists an opportunity to perhaps um, 
as Mr. Kong shared his recommendations on having that regional approach to, to niche markets, if there are any comments and thoughts on that from our panelists here. Or perhaps um, in his earlier comments about know. the proactivity as well, which is something that you, Alexander, um, on the panel would have spoken to. And perhaps Winsbird can chime in in terms of looking at, you know, equitable, um, having more equity among the value chain actors, especially for fishers. So um, perhaps we would, we would um, start with, with Alex, then switch over to Winsbird, and then have um, Peter's intervention. So that's how we'll, we'll manage that. So Alex, go ahead. I'll really quickly return um, to the idea that Mr. Kong, but I think all really excellent comments. Um, but the comment he made towards the end on um, clustering or economic clusters. I think, you know, fish reproduction in the Caribbean region, it is de facto an economic cluster. And I think collectively sharing marketing costs to access external markets is the way to go because, you know, a lot of the islands the producers are small and, and the transaction cost of accessing external market is quite high. So I think collectively marketing to the diaspora, it makes sense. You know, that's how you do multi-destination tourism. You know, that's how you pay for marketing in an international market where it costs a lot. So I think that that makes a lot of sense um, going in regionally. But I think the equity of value chain actors is, is actually, I think, one of the most important points about fisheries in general, but also one of the greatest risks in expanding the blue economy. You know, there's a, a risk that people could say, well, look, we're making more money from the ocean. That's great. But really the question is, well, how is the money being distributed? I think, you know, coming back to the idea of the seafood story, I think in the Caribbean, you know, we praise and we reward, you know, if you ask, you know, a Caribbean person on every island, who is the major distributor for the island? Who is the major, you know, food seller of the island? Which is the biggest supermarket, you know, people know. Um, same thing, you know, for your big seafood producers. So I think kind of shifting the narrative away from saying, wow, that person is a business person. Look at the fleet of trucks they have. Look at the complicated the distribution work they're doing. You know, we, we put a lot of value on that. Well, actually, let's take it even further back and say, well, you know, somebody is risking their life using very specialized scientific knowledge on the ocean to access this product. Um, you know, this knowledge is almost more specialized than distribution, marketing, you know, owning a, a big company. So I think shifting that narrative towards recognizing the fisher folk, the fisherman, the fisherwoman, the, the, the processor, as the person who is specialized operator was very specialized skill that narrative needs to, to begin to go out there so um, that we can begin to shift some of the income towards the beginning of the value chain where it really should be so i oh, hope that's useful but re really va valuable and, and valid comments by Mr. thank you alex um over to you Winsbert, um for you for your intervention um, well, nice um, question. Is it something as a fisherman that I was asking myself as well? Is that most of the, the stuff that I put around the region and even in, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is that everyone is looking straight to the international market. And we around the region are really not looking to see how we can do business with each other that could cut costs and fisher folks can be um, beneficial benefit from and also to see how fisher folks and fishing organization including the um the cfo how we can get on board into getting branded and laboring where fisher folks can really say here is the organization in the region the cnfo here the fisher folks could come together and see how we can brand and to see how we can move fish from one caribbean country then take it up to the um to the international level. So that is the approach I more will look at at a, at a region. But I think locally, I think the region is more focusing. And even in country, you are focusing international only. You need to get the fish to the European market. You need to get the fish into the European market. While the Caribbean countries do not have the fish that other Caribbean countries do have. And when it come to policies, I think that um. The fishing industry are the fishing, the fisher folks itself. If you have an industry that is made up of fishing and agriculture, majority of the agriculture get the benefit of the doubt. And then when there is development, that the fisher folks is the one uh, them being squeezed out. And then you have no set of information and no communication with the fisher folks. More than information, 
coming out of the fisher folks and there's nobody really feeding back the um, um information to the fisher folks so i think there's a big 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 gap as i said in my presentation that we need to look at regionally and into and and as from cnfo standpoint we need to see how we can come in and speak to the fisher folks and fisher folks group around the region to see how we can attract and to see how we could have benefit for fisher folks that's my comment thank you so much for that um Winsworth. and in in definitely raising it you're getting thumbs up definitely raising some important um aspects there especially from the fisher folk perspective I believe Peter would have left his comment in uh, the chat. And so I'll, I'll just read what he has there and then recognizing our panelists, Ms. Cruz. So Peter put in the chat in the early 1990s, um, the OECS Fisheries Unit did a study which looked at marketing of OECS fishery products. And this study suggested joint marketing of products as high price exotic Caribbean fish to target high-end markets um all right so miss cruz you can go ahead and unmute yourself to make your intervention thank you miss compton just following from the conversation um initiated by mr gregory um from the belize perspective and our experience really um we've learned that we had to develop our understanding of our fisheries sector and of the realities in terms of opportunities and challenges faced by our fishers um i think what is important is to for for small island developing countries like our nations within the region we need to um assess our fisheries and understand really what those needs are for handling, for processing, for market branding, and really develop an outline of best practices and skills that are requisite for us to now enter um, in fairly into those markets. Um, we all know that um, as small nations, we are trying to target these huge markets, but we are often restricted because of the um, in importing countries, technical barriers to trade, or when it comes to the sanitary aspects of the resources that we're trading. And it, for, for Belize, it is very um, imperative that we develop um, our skill sets for our fishers, for our stakeholders, so that they can definitely move into and access those markets. Um, we have been obtaining this understanding under not, underneath that GCF project that FAO has been implementing. And we have developed the kind of capacity building concepts that we believe will help our fishers to um, access these markets. Now, we go back to the, the, the comment about equity from the Belize Blue Economy uh, ministerial perspective. We are working on a governance framework and a legislation that will now recognize um, the realities within the blue space and specifically honing in on how conservation is married to economic growth within our spaces. And what has also motivated us is Belize's commitment to the Blue Loan uh, Conservation Funding Agreement, where we have now prioritized conservation, ensuring that spaces will be secured for fish stocks to now replenish and give back to the societal development of our country, of our nation, and of course, for the economic benefits that they provide. So I just wanted to highlight some of that, um, so that some of that experience from Belize. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Cruz. And we did have a question in the, in the Q&A section of which I would read, and then we'll have our panel panelists um, take uh, the first go at it. 
but also we do have quite an experienced audience. So again, feel free anyone amongst yourselves to, to add to this dialogue, to add to this conversation. Uh, the question in Q&A was posed by Chris Milley and this question was, this has been a very interesting and informative session. I wonder though, how are the issues of food security or food sovereignty prioritized in the national and industry initiatives to advance local or regional blue economies? No ready intervention from our panel, but we do have hands raised. You have the floor, Mr. Cump. Thank you so much, Chair. Mm -hmm. All of these webinars are linked. You know, we spoke about so many different things, and I'm sure they're linked, and I'm sure that there is um, some um um that you, that crfm is going to put all of this together at, at some point are the request is is it possible to um send out these links um separately apart from just in the chat here i i've seen some comments some very interesting comments from the audience uh what i heard from Belize a while ago i'm very much interested in seeing these these documentation the policy the framework and that other thing is it possible for crfm to collate this and to circulate this um chair thanks Thank you for that. And certainly it is very possible. We will be circulating um, all the resources as well as um, this webinar. And so you can, um, and presenters can also send their resources to be included in the package that send, is sent out. And we'll be also sharing the, the PowerPoint. So it, it will all be collated and sent to um, registrants as well as um, all wider audience um, for CRFM throughout the member states. So all will have access to, to the materials. Peter, you can go ahead with your intervention. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair, Moderator. I just wanted to point to the fact in response to Chris Miller's question um, that the CRFM Ministerial Council at, at its last meeting, 17th, I think, um, actually approved a, a protocol on um, aquatic foods um, as a contributor, I suppose you could say, to food security and implicitly to food sovereignty. Um, and, and so that is at least one way we see a prioritization, prioritization of that um, at the regional level. And this, of course, is in keeping with the CARICOM um, Food and Nutrition um, Strategy and Action Plan. So at least at the regional level, we have taken a look at, at that type of prioritization that Chris has asked about, um, which also in a way relates to the question that, that is, is, is Royal Highness um, Andre Kong had, had mentioned. But um, in the interest of time, I won't go much further just to make that note, so thank you. Thank you for that, um, Peter, and that certainly does uh, provide an answer to Mr. Millie's question. I believe he would have already left today's session, but we can certainly provide that feedback for him. I just want to recognize a comment that was made by Mr. Pameshwar Jainarai, um, who is from Guyana. And he added here in the chat, just for clarity in Guyana, females are not restricted from being major players in the fishing sector. For example, being in management positions at the co-ops. In fact, one of the major co-op societies has a lady as the chairperson and over 75% of vendors are females and there are many female boat owners. So speaking to equity and equality and of course gender um, from the perspective of gender. So that is good to, to know. Thank you for that, um, Mr. Dinerine. And we're getting close to wrapping up to today's session again. It was one that was condensed um, when we're talking about the, the blue economy. There's so much um, perspectives from which we can, of course, speak to and, and explore. And um, CR Fram does recognize the potential of the blue economy, in particular, the small scale fisheries and aquaculture to provide, of course, food, jobs, livelihoods, and a source of sustainable and sustainable social and economic growth and development of and for our member states. So this is just gonna be a final call for any other interventions in today's discussion. 
Um, if there's anything anyone wants to add, go ahead. With um, you. <laughs> one of the things I like to add in the question is what Peter just responded to is what we are seeing as well too is that when we look at um, food security and how the local forces eat. I think there is something in, 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 the, in the government in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the idea they are, tough, they are pushing and is that fisher folks should try meet the international market. And there's nothing really on the agenda how we feed our local persons. And we need to really capture that because everything we need to export, we need the GDP to go up. And while our local persons are not getting the fish to eat because when we ship we all the good fish, the high-end fish, what we leave the local to, to eat on. And when they have development now um, that has taken place, where persons used to go and catch the inshore pelagic, like the catfish, the rabbit, and they don't have access to these beach to be, do these harvesting, then the persons, then we have a problem with our food and how persons in community um, um, get access to food at a reasonable price because what I've noticed that um, if we continue the way we're going looking at the international market, I think that our local persons will have non-quality fish to eat and it will be of a board in terms of how persons get fish to eat in their community. Thank you. Thank you. And that certainly is an important conversation to, to be had. Um, for the sake of time now, I'm just going to ask um, our panelists for any any other thoughts, any other additions to today's discussion before we officially close out and take our um, closing remarks from Mr. Murray? Go ahead, Ms. Cruz. Thank you, Ms. Compton. So I just wanted to um, weigh in with the conversation from our dear colleague. <laughs> um, and, and I want to agree that in reality, he's from a fisher's perspective, these are some of the shortcomings that even Belizean fishers have faced. Um, but as I have highlighted, when it comes to fish and fish products, it's very, very um, important to our domestic food security, as well as to um, its contribution in the international um, markets. Uh, nonetheless, I think um, from the Belizean experience, what we've, what we've observed is that there's a need for um, a participatory approach and integration of legislation and regulations for the protection of species, of your fish species, those high quality fish species, protection of viable areas, fishing grounds, locations, spawning, aggregating sites, and also protection in terms of access by our people, our nationals, um, the members of your, your, your country, of your state. The issue of capacity building and awareness building is, is a never ending thing. And, and let me, uh, may I dare say, say that a vast majority of fishers do not understand the issues. I mean, when we talk about the, the, the ministerial council saying this and this, saying that, it's, it's a very difficult thing. So we need to redouble our efforts to bring the fishers on board, to build their capacity, and to make them aware of the issues, because many of them aren't. And of course, it's their fault sometimes because they don't want to participate, but it's a never ending um, um, problem that we have. I just want to make that, 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 that part in um, comment. Thanks, Jer. Um, thank you again. It is important. It always is important to really um, drive home the understanding um, for capacity building and what that should really look like and mean. All right, so that would be the end of our moderated session. And I would now invite Mr. Peter A. Murray to give us our closing remarks. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, I had been instructed that in, in making my closing remarks, I'd basically try to, to capture um, the, the main points that had come out of, 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 the, of the webinar and the discussion. I find myself um, for, for, for probably the third time in my life challenged to do that. Um, simply because there's so much, such a wealth of information, of thoughts, of thinking that was produced there that in the five minutes allocated to me, I don't think I can capture it all. So I will try, attempt to summarize. For me, one of the main points that came out 
it deals with the challenges. Challenges in terms of, for example, uh, in, increased competition within the blue economy and other blue economy industries. That was, that came out from a, 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 at least two of, of the presenters, including in, in, in the general discussion. However, um, there are a lot of opportunities available to us when we look at fisheries in the context of the blue economy. And among them, I think, um, was import substitution in the case of Car within CARICOM. This is especially important in the context of a 25 by 25 mandate given by the heads of government. Um, and also making, taking advantage of potential international demands for Caribbean food and, 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 and food products, notwithstanding the concern expressed by at least a couple of times, um, including most recently by WINS, but in terms of the ability um, of 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 the of the sector to deal with, um, and I quote from him, but how we feed our local persons. So among the opportunities we we see in terms of blue economic growth is the utilization of the fishery sector in terms of feeding our own people. Um, I think it's also important to note the examples we got from the countries, for example, um, the Belize experience, which pointed to the need to, to understand and address the inefficiencies that are there, um, noting the opportunities to develop new products in new markets, and that came up also by uh, in another example. In terms of the Guyana CBOB value chain, we, we came across um, an important point was the, the lack of, of standards um, and, and infrastructure. In some cases, the supportive in infrastructure for blue economic growth in the context of the fishery sector. The linkages with other economic sectors was also important. I think um, the tourism sector came up as two places where there are linkages, um, as came up on two occasions um, where there are linkages with the um, fishery sector. But interestingly enough, while in terms of the industrial CBOB aspects, I mean, Guyana, the question of operational health and safety plans were developed um, and the development of them and the importance of that to maintain certification. I, that one struck me as something that I don't think we've paid enough attention to. Um, we have looked at, at sanitary and phytosanitary conditions, traceability, these things in terms of maintaining um, certification. But last year, um, in terms of, of ILO, fisheries dropped from being the number one most dangerous occupation in the world to the number five, but it still is in the, in, in the top five. So the question of occupational health and safety um, is an important one in terms of exploring the opportunities, the true, true opportunities within the sector. Uh, I think also um, Winsbutt Win made a point that, that, that resonated with me, especially in the context of, of, of the Ministerial Council's um, decision at its eighth special meeting in terms of gender and youth. Um, in, in, and Winsbutt spoke to the need to attract young persons, including females, into the sector. While we had a comment in the chat speaking about the, the prevalence um, of ladies in, in the sector in, in, in Guyana, um, but I think the, the importance of that cannot be overstated. Um, more needs to be done in terms of the, the post-corona and, and, and similar events, post-pandemic um, events, post-global events, and looking at that, the issue of Sargassum and Sahara dust came up, um, and in a number of instances, we also gave consideration to the issue of capacity building, the importance of capacity building, not just in the broad context of fisheries, but in terms of dealing with things like, like, like climate change and the impacts on the fishery sector. Um, I think the experiences of Suriname in the development of um, the industry there, the experiences of Ocean Delight, I think, very, very important. Um, the, the, the essential point of job security and where industries like that um, can actually provide job security for a number of families. The point was not, you know, the point that, that Udo made was not just about job security for individuals, but the fact that that redounded 
to security and livelihoods of families. I think the estimate that FAO gives for the Caribbean is that for every one person directly involved in capture, um, there are four other persons that benefit. So you're talking about five persons. So if you're talking about that 170 people that Udo mentioned, multiplied by four, and you see in terms of the number of people that are impacted on and the spin-off effects. I think that was important. He also spoke to the importance of introducing lesser species, especially in the context of 25 by 25. We've been speaking about the, the big the big ones, the lobsters and the conks and the tunas, but there are lesser known species that help, can help contribute to meeting that 25 by 2025 uh, target. In terms of the general discussion, his, His Royal Highness uh, G G um, Mr. Kong pointed to the question of the absence of equity among blue economic sector. I think that is very, very important. When we speak about the blue economy and expanding it, do we have or can we ensure that there's equity among all the subsectors of this blue economy sector? Um, the need to be more forceful in terms of the international um, um, in terms of what we do internationally, the, the need um, to take a regional approach to, to accessing some of the markets. These are all the things that came out. Very, very useful, very important, very interactive. Uh, all the presentations were, were good. So at this point in time, in closing, let me say thank you very much to all who participated on behalf of the, the Secretariat of the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism. I, I take the opportunity on behalf of the Executive Director to say thank you and look out for more webinars coming up. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, Peter, for the closing remarks. And thank you again. I would echo the same thank you to our panelists, to our director for his opening remarks, and to each of you who joined us and for those of you who stuck throughout the time um, the topic is definitely one that um, solicits a lot of good conversation and discussion that needs to be had so again thank everyone for their time and look out again for our updates on the next webinar as well as for all the resources and information coming out of this webinar today